Jesus Christ and to go, to, to go on mission with God, whether that be short term mission or to go out into our community uh, for different events that are going on or to uh, go into mission for the remainder of your life as God calls you. We have a group here this morning that John Humphreys works with uh, called God's Followers. And they're going to be going, leaving actually tomorrow. John, would you come and share as we get started uh, about your trip? Now, you told me in the first service you just wanted to share a few words. Now, that was, that was preacher speak you gave in the first service. Okay. I speak like my brother James. Very few words, ho ho. Uh, first of all, I want to thank all of you for your support, your generous financial support, your spiritual prayers, your encouragement. Without that support, we wouldn't be going tomorrow. So a great big thank you. When we come back, we're going to be uh, putting on a thank you concert just for you guys, for the, first, uh, for the Karen Baptist Church. You all have been wonderful. We would ask for your continued prayers as we go on our trip tomorrow. We leave tomorrow night out of Walker Field in Grand Junction. And I'll just tell you briefly uh, what our schedule is. Tuesday, the girls are going to go to the beach for the first time in their lives. Wednesday morning, we're going to take a tour of the battleship USS Iowa. In the afternoon, we're going to the Aquarium of the Pacific. Wednesday night, we will be doing our concert at Ocean View Baptist Church. And then Thursday morning, we're going on a celebrity tour of Hollywood. <coughs> See how the other half lives. Um, and in the afternoon, we're taking the girls on a window shopping trip down Rodeo Drive. For those of you who don't know what that is, it's an exclusive shopping area where all the rich and famous people go. And then we'll take them to realistic shopping afterwards so they can buy some souvenirs, et cetera. And then we fly back on Friday. So um, we're really excited. It's been two years in the making. We were supposed to go this time last year, but because of COVID, we had to cancel and um, do it this year. So again, please pray for us, not just for Wednesday night, but that the Lord will open up opportunities for us to share Jesus. And now the girls will sing Broken Vessels, Amazing Grace. Yes, we are coming back. Jars of clay, so 
take this heart, Lord, I'll be your vessel, the world to see your life in me. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saves a wretch like me. So in addition to John and Barb on the piano, we're going to be having uh, Mike and Sherry Burns and Plasoke, uh, which is Supawa's older brother, go along as cha chaperones too. And so uh, we prayed for them in the first service. Let's, in our opening prayer, pray for them in this service as well uh, before they depart from us. Uh, so would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, what a great way to open up a service of worship to you, King Jesus. We thank you for the sweet voices of God's followers, all the work that they have put in, that John has to plan their trip, and also the rehearsals to get ready so they can do their concert at Ocean View Baptist Church on Wednesday night. And Lord, may we as their church family Go with them in spirit. Pray over them and ask for you to orchestrate every step of this trip according to your plan and your will. <clears throat> Pray you'd keep them all safe and healthy as they go. And they won't worry, uh, but yet they will walk in hope. Uh, they won't be fearful, but they'll walk by faith. Uh, they will not be afraid or anxious at any moment, but God, you would fill them with your perfect love and nothing will get in the way of this experience being exactly what you desire, our Father, for our sisters and brothers that go out from us tomorrow and return, God willing, on Friday evening. So... Let your spirit be with them all. Help them to remember to pack their bathing suits for the beach. And also uh, their costumes uh, that they will wear as they give the concert. God, be glorified. And be glorified in this remainder of this service of worship as we share together in Jesus' name. And let everyone say, Amen. Amen. Thank you, Barb, for 
doing double time for us here. Glad to have you. Uh, you might have picked up a bulletin or not uh, when you came in. In the bulletin, it has information about our announcements. Here we are on August the very first. And so uh, makes us start thinking about school starting, camps being over, although Thaddeus has another camp planned with the youth in a couple of weeks uh, to go camping before school starts. So be reminded of that. Awana Club will be coming up. Opportunities throughout the school year to help get more plugged in besides just uh, the Sunday morning uh, being here for worship. Uh, today, uh, Laura Gartner is going to be giving the message she did in the first service, and she also speaks out at the Austin Baptist Church on Saturdays and hold worship. Uh, we have an event coming up there at the end of the month, the last Saturday of the month, the 28th of August, where we need some help from our Delta family. We're putting on a community fellowship barbecue right at the church. And we're going to have some like bump and jumps for the kids. Uh, we're going to have some things to hand out to our community. In fact, we're doing that probably this week uh, to hand out to our neighbors to invite them to come. But if you'd like to help with that, uh, it's about a three hour, four hour commitment on Saturday, August the 28th, as we look to continue to uh, restart that church. It got down in 2016 to to just two couples that were coming to the church. Now we double and triple that. So how many churches can say they've done that in five years? Uh, <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, we also, uh, over the weekend, uh, I told you I went to Denver and greetings from Steve Van Ostrin and everyone at the American Baptist Churches of the Rocky Mountain region. And they're inviting us to come join them in Denver on the at the end of September and I have applications it's the annual gathering and it's going to be learning about how to get your church unstuck uh, there is a group that's coming in Tony Morgan and a friend of his Michael Moore they're going to be talking about getting unstuck and especially after COVID how churches can look where they're at and see where they want to be and how to get from point A to point B. And so you can see me after the service about this uh, event that's going on. Uh, also, if you would like to join me after about four o'clock tomorrow afternoon, our God's followers are going to be meeting here at the church and then taking off to go to the airport in Grand Junction. And I think it'd be great to have a number of people just come out and just and see them off. Uh, it won't cost you anything. That activity is free. Just meet here about four o'clock tomorrow afternoon, and uh, we can see them off. And uh, I won't make you be back here on Friday night when they get back. But I think it would speak to them and their families. Uh, and I'm going to encourage the Corinne Church to also come out tomorrow night, and that'd be good interaction for all of us uh, as we say so long for them as they go on this mission trip. Um, I don't think I have anything else to share, but uh, let Laura come. And share the message that God's laid on her heart today. And so I think Jim will have you all set up and so come and share with the church. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I hope everybody's having a great day. Um, let's pray first. Um, Heavenly Father, I just uh, thank you for this day. I thank you for all who have uh, come and gathered here today. I pray for those who couldn't make it. Uh, may you be with them. Lord, I just uh, lift up everyone in this building uh, that uh, they would uh, take your message and run with it and uh, just learn to have a great relationship with you and to have a healthy relationship with themselves so that they can go out and be good disciples and make relationships with others. So God, just help us uh, get receive the message and, and, and to just learn from it and grow from it. God, I just uh, hope that your words um, will be heard today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So today I wanted to, uh, well actually I'm doing a, a sermon series on relationships in Austin. 
this is the first part of it. Um, we're going to be talking about a relationship with God and relationship with self. Um, if you want to hear the rest of it, come to church in Austin at 11 on Saturdays and you can catch the rest of it. <laughs> um, so what does relationship mean? Relationship means the way in which two or more concepts, objects, or people are connected or the state of being connected. Um, for example, a concept, a relationship or connection with a concept would be like uh, at work. Um, two concepts have a relationship at work so that you can get the work done or like the government. Um, Republican, Democrat, they're two concepts that have a connection, a relationship. Um, objects would be uh, like the computer and the internet. They connect together, they have a relationship. For, but for the purposes of this sermon, we're going to be talking about concepts and, and, and people, not really objects, unless it comes up as like an idol or something. Um, people, of course, an example, family, friends, community, and hopefully God. Um, so what does the Bible say about relationships or being connected? Well, the Bible tells us that we were created for the sole purpose to have connection or relationship with God. That's the sole purpose why he, uh, God created us, was so that we could have a relationship with him. I didn't get back. There we go. Genesis 1.26 tells us, Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness and let him have domain over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creepy thing that creeps on the earth sounds like a lot of relationships doesn't it <laughs> God made us for relationship that doesn't mean that the God of love created man because he needed someone to love, that he needed someone to have a relationship. He created man because he wanted to share his love with him. He wanted to have a relationship and share his love. 1 John 4.19 tells us we love because he first loved us. 1 John 4.8 tells us anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. So God created man for the sole purpose of sharing his love to have a relationship. Then he created woman so that man could have a relationship with woman and share, continue to share the love of God. We were made for the sole purpose to have relationship and connection. However, our connection with God has to come first. Connection with God and others fulfill the desire of us wanting to be whole. We all desire the, to be whole. None of us want to be empty. Um, we all want to feel whole. Well, the only way to do that is to have a relationship with God. I know before I knew God, I tried to stuff everything I could into that hole to, to fill it. And it always ran empty or it always got me in trouble. Um, I got a quote here from the I can find it from the Bible project that I thought was really fitting for this um, um, Cindy from the Bible project she said some of us probably assume that we know what there is to know about connection or maybe connection feels too difficult too risky too painful or simply too time-consuming. Perhaps connection feels like one more thing to do in order to be a good person, rather than something that is life-giving. But the biblical story gives us a different perspective on connection, one that is first and foremost rooted in the identity of God. So the question begs to answer, how do you have a relationship with God? And the journey must begin there. It has to begin there. In the Old Testament, Moses repeatedly, um, I was going to write down all the verses for you, but there is many that uh, Moses repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly told the Israelites to love their God with all their heart, soul, and mind, with everything they had. This is so important that Jesus quoted these words in Matthew 22, 37. He quoted them because without this relationship, all other relationships, including your relationship with yourself, will be distorted. And it will fail to bring you wholeness. 
It may temporarily appease you, but it will fail to bring you wholeness. I know this because before I knew Christ, I saw people for their faults. I intentionally, when I met someone, I would seek out their faults first. Now this wasn't because I wanted to be better than them. This was because if I saw you for your faults, I knew you were a bad person. And if you were a bad person, I could keep you at arm's length. And it made sense. <laughs> I didn't have to justify it because I rationalized it that way in my mind. I kept all people at arm's reach. This left me feeling alone and relationshipless. That included a relationship with myself. However, but God, now that I have been awakened through Jesus Christ to the truth of God, I can see past the faults and actually grow rather than be stuck. I can, I can be attracted to the faults because God gives me purpose in those. I can, I can serve my neighbor through their faults. I can watch people like myself. I can watch people, they have a fault, and then God changes it just dramatically or slowly. You get to see that and be a part of that if you actually begin with God. It has to begin with God. It has to. So I broke down five ways that we can continually have a relationship with him. Five, five steps that may not be simple all the time, but they're easy to remember. The first step is you have to believe he exists. <laughs> How can you have a relationship with something you don't think exists? Um, Hebrews 11 6 tells us, and without faith it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. We have to believe he exists. We have to believe that God is who he says he is. In Exodus 3.14, God identifies himself as, I am who I am. We have to believe and trust in that, that God is who he is. We have to believe that he is the Trinity, that he is the Father and the Son and the Spirit. We have to believe that he is all-powerful, that he is all-knowing, that he is everywhere, all the time. That seems scary, but it's not. <laughs> He's all-loving. He has no sin. We have to believe these things. Otherwise, we can't have a relationship with God because that's who he is, and God does not change. And if we can't accept God for who he is, we can't have a relationship with him. It, it becomes very difficult. So we have to believe he exists, and we have to believe he is who he is. Secondly, we have to talk to God. Our first talk with God is when we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior. John 3, 16. And then we have to have faith in our hope. When we talk to God, we have to tell him, I have faith in you who are my hope. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. We have to tell Jesus, I trust you. We have to confess. We have to confess that Jesus is Lord, and we have to confess our sins to him. Now remember, Jesus is everywhere, so if you think you're hiding stuff from him, uh, you're wrong. <laughs> he sees it all. So why even, I mean, when you go to prayer with him, why hide it from him? I know it's hard, and it can be shameful. You feel shameful, but God doesn't see you that way, and we're going to get into that later. Romans 10, 9 through 13 says, Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For the heart, for with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. We have to confess this daily. 
hourly, minutely sometimes. Um, I don't know about you, but there are days where I have to remind myself every second that God is in control. That's what a relationship with God will bring you. You have to give thanks. Not only do you have to confess, you have to give thanks. And this isn't to just say, oh, thank you, Lord, for getting my rent paid, or thank you, Lord, for the new shoes, or thank you, Lord, for bringing my health back. This is, thank you, Lord, that I was put to the test today. Thank you, Lord, that I am going through this trial right now. It's hard to do. It's hard to do. You need to have a friend that you can trust that's not going to gossip about you, that is not only going to listen to you, but pray with you and for you. It's important. That's what a relationship with God gives you, gets you. But you have to give thanks. You have to talk to God. You have to confess and you have to give thanks in every circumstance. That's what Paul says. In every circumstance, be content and give thanks. Third, we have to repent. Oh, that's the hard one. Repent. We have to repent. Repentance means to make a 180 turn from sin. It's not a 360 turn. It's a 180 turn. It means to turn all the way around and not look back. Repentance is a response to the work of the Holy Spirit. It's the work of the Holy Spirit that convicts you and convinces you. He doesn't just convict you. He convinces you that you are wrong and that you are in error. And we're human. We're going to be wrong every day. I'm wrong every day a lot of, a lot of times. So if you think you're wrong, not wrong uh, or if you're right all the time, you probably should re-examine that. 2 Corinthians, uh, let me get on the right page, 7.10. Turned it too quick. 7, 9 through 10 says, I rejoice not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting, for you felt a godly grief, so that you suffered no loss through us, for godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret. Godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret. That's the best news I've heard all day <laughs> about y'all. <laughs> Proverbs 28, 13 tells us, Whoever conceals his trans transgressions will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. You can't just confess it. You have to forsake it. You have to repent. Luke 15, 7 says, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 persons who need no repentance. One person. God is up there, tears down his face, and the angels are singing. I can close my eyes and see it. I hope that you can, because that's what happens when you repent, when you confess and repent. It makes God the Lord's so happy because he can use you for his purpose. And we'll get into that later too. <laughs> Fourth, we have to study and listen. Psalms 119, 105 tells us, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Know the word, know God, because God is the word. If you don't know his word, you can't know him. If you don't know his word, you're going to be tricked by every little phlegm that comes by. If you don't know the word, you're not going to be comforted. Because that's where our comfort comes from when the we find our comfort in here. We know God from these words. We start a relationship by opening this book. It's important to not just study, but to listen. I would heed Samuel's example in 1 Samuel 3. Samuel, he hears, he hears God and, and he runs to Eli. What, what, what are you saying to me? What are you saying to me? Eli says, go back to bed. Again, he does it again. And the third time, third time. And the Lord came and stood, calling as at another time. Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, 
Speak, for your servant hears. I am listening, Lord. I want to hear your voice. I want you to guide me. Because remember where you end up when you do all the talking. Alone. You have to have mutual communication. Study and listen. Fifth step, be mindful. We have to be mindful. Romans 12, 2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God and what is good and acceptable and perfect. We have to be mindful of what we study and listen and hear from God. We have to be mindful of it. We have to be mindful of, of it all the time because it's what's going to save us from, you know, putting our foot in our mouth, <laughs> saying a rude thing, uh, doing a rude action, um, being hateful to, to anybody. That's what stops us from doing that is being mindful transforming every day rather than conforming. It takes time to build a relationship, and this is even true with God. It doesn't happen overnight. God loves you the same every day, but when you're building your relationship with him, it does take time. But I promise you that by keeping our relationship with God first and foremost, we are then truly able to see ourselves and others as he does. We are able to truly have a relationship with him. And through that, things happen. I am proof of that. I tell you what. <laughs> things happen. So what about ourself? How do we have a godly relationship with ourselves? Sounds like a crazy question, right? Well, I'm not talking about like me, myself, and Irene. <laughs> I'm just talking about having a healthy being, seeing myself as God sees me so that I can go out and do the work he has put me here for. Our relationship with self begins with understanding that each one of us were purposely and specifically made by God with purpose. We have to see ourselves in that first. We have to understand that. Psalms 139, thir uh, 13 through 16 says, for you formed my inner inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's wound. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. Praise the Lord. God purposely made you. God purposely gave you purpose. And we can't begin to see ourselves as God does until we know this through and through. We have to know this fact through and through. God purposely made you with purpose. On purpose. <laughs> when a relationship with God begins and grows we can then and only then begin to have a healthy relationship with ourselves so how does God see you? Well, he sees you if you are a born again saved Christian sitting here today he sees you as a new creation if you're not he wants to see you as a new creation he sees you as a new person. 2 Corinthians 5.17 tells us, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He sees you as a new creation. He sees you as his child. You are a child of God. John 1.12 tells us, But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. 
You are a child of God, and that's how he sees you as his child. If you're a parent, you, you can understand that love of, I will love you no matter what. <laughs> that's what God has for you. God sees your body as a temple. He sees you as a vessel, and it should be treated as such. He sees your body as a temple. 1 Corinthians 3.16 tells us, do, this is Paul speaking, do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? The moment you were saved, the Holy Spirit lived in you. The moment you were saved, God lived in you. Your body is a temple and it should be treated as such. Ephesians 5.29 through 30 says, For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. <laughs> we got to take care of ourselves. We got to eat right and exercise. And I'm not saying that you can't splurge and eat a whole pie every once in a while. I do that for breakfast sometimes, I'll admit. <laughs> But we need to take care of ourselves so that we're ready and prepared when God chooses to use us. So we're not holding ourselves up when the moment comes. God sees us in some pretty amazing ways, but we must be careful to not become full of ourselves. Because it's not us that does these awesome things, it's God. Romans 12, 3 says, for by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sound, uh, sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. It's God. It's God who's doing this for you. Because you have a relationship with him. Our relationship with ourselves must be grounded in the spirit and not the flesh. It has to be grounded in the spirit, not the flesh. We see the uh, fruit of the spirit in Galatians. Romans 8, 6 tells us, For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Be grounded in the spirit, not in the flesh. When we see ourselves as God does, we can accomplish all these things, right? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me because he's the one that's doing it. We can love ourselves and care for ourselves. As we just learned, that's okay. Just beware that you don't slip into the trap of selfishness. That's what the world is digging holes for you or making mounds or trying to trap you. Because the world will tell you that it's me that's important. Now, even though you want a healthy relationship with yourself, it's God that's important. It has to start there. Selfishness. J James 3.16 tells us it causes disorder and evil, evil practices. It causes you to turn your back on God, like the young rich ruler in Matthew. It destroys relationships with others. It hinders prayer. It is the product of earthly wisdom. Selfishness is destruction. You can take care of yourself and not be selfish. Yes. Remember what Paul said in Philippians 2. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Genuine humility is the only way to combat selfishness. One way I do it is I pray for the people I don't like. 
I got to love them, but I don't have to like them. I stick with that. <laughs> so I pray for them, and you know what? I learned to love them. It happens. It is important to remember that seeing yourself as God is a lifelong process. It doesn't happen overnight. I wish it did, but it doesn't. But never give up on the faith that gives you hope. Because when you ground yourself in the relationship with God and you see yourself as he does, you have the hope of Jesus Christ. God loves you, never gives up on you, leads you, and gives you purpose, purposefully. <laughs> I am your humble servant, Lord. Say it with me. I am your humble servant, Lord. I am a child of God. I'm a new creation. And my relationship with self wholly depends on my relationship with you. If you remember nothing else from this sermon, remember that. Everything depends on your relationship with him. And if you want to be a healthy, whole person, learn to know your father. Learn to know your savior. Let the Holy Spirit guide you and convict you and convince you. Amen? Heavenly Father, I just uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here to give your message. I just uh, hope that, that we would get, get real with our relationship with you, that we wouldn't uh, sugarcoat it or that we wouldn't put it on the back burner, that you would be the first thing on our mind and, and out of our mouths in the morning and that you would be the last thing on our mind and out of our mouths at night and that in, through every blessing and circumstance, trial and tribulation that happens through the day that we are looking for you, to you for our strength and comfort, God, because with you we can do anything, anything that your, your, your will has set us out to do, God. So I just, I thank you for that. I thank you that uh, you created us to know you and that you don't change and that we can trust who you are and that we can trust that you exist and that we can talk with you and we can confess and repent and that you give us the ability to be mindful, God. Lord, help us to see ourselves as you do so that we can go out with a smile on our face, not a, not a full head, not a big head, but a smile on our face saying, look what my God did for me and look what my God can do for you because that's the disciple we want to be. We just thank you. Thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.